Uh, we're going to continue our, uh, our uh, series on Chosen. This is week two uh, for that. Um, last week, we were, we were kind of reminded about the awesomeness of God, that he, that he chose us uh, uh, for, for, for work with, with him. And, uh, and today, um, we're going to kind of continue that, that, that idea, that, um, that the things that we're chosen for, um, you know, those are, those are honors that God places on us. And, uh, and we all know that, that God loves us, uh, but what we're going to talk about today, I really think will we'll, we'll, um, we'll describe um, the, the depths that he went to, to make sure that we had a relationship with him. And, and so uh, on, the, on the screen, um, there's a picture of a, of a guy, hopefully he'll put it up there, this, uh, there should be a picture in there somewhere of my brother. He's old, isn't he? I hope he's watching uh, via live streaming. You look old on this picture, big brother. And there's his beautiful bride, uh, Chris. And so it's Kevin and Chris. That's my brother and my, my sister-in-law. And, uh, and uh, I, I will say this. You won't hear me talk nice about my brother very often. Um, but he's a really great guy. Um, and they're a wonderful, wonderful couple. Uh, they've raised a beautiful, strong uh, uh, daughter uh, by the name of Shandy. Um, she uh, is a nurse uh, in Texas, has, has children of her own, and, uh, and it's their only biological child. And, uh, and, uh, and it wasn't because they gave up, uh, you know, on having kids after her. She was really pretty easy um, to, to raise. Um, it was just because it just didn't work out uh, that they were able to have uh, other kids. Um, they, they tried uh, to do that, uh, um, and, um, and when they realized they weren't going to be able to do that, they decided that they were going to be foster parents. Um, I don't think in the back of their mind they ever really thought uh, that, that that would lead to where it led to for, for them, uh, but as being foster parents, so they, they brought in these two uh, little boys into their home, uh, Chad and Cody, and, uh, and Chad and Cody, um, um, they, they just kind of fell in love with them. They, they, they had uh, uh, Chad and Cody we had a very... A very uh, rough childhood. Um, and when I mean rough, I mean both of their parents were, were incarcerated, both were involved in, in drugs and, and different, uh, uh, different uh, elements of, of, of a bad life. And, and when they came uh, to be foster, to, to, to foster them, they, they just kind of automatically fell in love with them. And as they, they fell in love with them and, and they went to different places and, and uh, the kids fell in love with, uh, with my brother and my sister-in-law and, and, uh, and, and my, my brother, from the day that he brought them in as foster children, uh, treated them like his own. And, and uh, one of the stories that, uh, that I think of when you, when you think about how rough these kids had it was uh, they were going to a convenience store and the oldest uh, one uh, whose name is, is Chad uh, was in the convenience store and, and, uh, and it was just kind of acting like he really didn't know what to do. And my brother said, why don't you just pick, a, pick something, you know, if you want pop or, or, or chips or, or something, go ahead and, and get that. And, and so it took Chad forever to pick something. And my brother is kind of like me. He's a little bit impatient, and, and he's just kind of waiting on him. But since he was a foster kid, he didn't really push him too hard. And, and so, so when he finally picked, I think, a, a bottle of pop, um, and he walked up to the, to, the, um, to the cashier, put the bottle of pop up there. My, my brother looked down at Chad and said, um, is that all you want? And, and I'll never forget Chad's response. Chad looked up at him and said, you mean I didn't have both? See, the truth of the matter was, Chad wasn't even used to getting anything when he would go there. And so, so when he heard my, my brother say, hey, get what you want, he thought, well, i got to pick. And that's what took him so long. I mean, he was weighing, okay, do I want chips? Do I want candy? Do I want, do I want a bottle of pop? And, and I think it was at that moment that, that hopefully Chad realized that, that, uh, that, that my brother loved him regardless of the fact he didn't really know him. And so as, as, as foster kids, uh, they, they turned into, to, they were finally able to adopt them. 
And, and so as they adopted them and he raised them up in, in, his, in his family and, and, uh, and, and he just, he, he gave them everything that uh, he gave uh, his, his, his biological daughter. He gave them uh, money. He gave them, he gave them care. He gave them love. He, he gave them um, words of wisdom. He, everything that my brother had from the moment that he adopted those two boys, he gave to them. And it was at their disposal. And the thing to understand is, is that my brother adopted my nephews before they fulfilled their potential. He didn't sit and wonder whether or not they were going to fulfill their potential or not. When my brother and my sister-in-law decided uh, that they were going to, 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 to adopt these two boys, they, they, they didn't sit and think, okay, how can I control their destiny? Um, uh, what they did was they said, you know what? We love you regardless of the fact that we don't know what your future is going to hold. We don't really know you. We, we, we didn't give birth to you. Uh, you you're really not of my blood. <laughs> But from the day that they were adopted, um, he loved them regardless of what their future was going to hold. And I think this is the same way uh, that God decides to act for us. You see, the truth is, is that God decided to adopt us into his family before we fulfilled our potential. Can I just be honest with you? None of you are so unique that you add something to God. I'm not so unique that I add anything to God. But it didn't matter. He loves each one of us so much and he adopted us and, and he didn't lock us into to following him even when he develop this plan to adopt us as, as part of his family. He, he, didn't, he didn't lock us into to, to those things. What he did is he predestined each and every person to follow him of their own free will. You see, one of the things I want you to understand before we really get into the scripture that we're going to look at here this morning is this idea of, of predestination. And you hear lots of people talking about predestined and, and the terms like the elect. And, and if, you, if you're not careful, you can walk away with this idea that God um, already knows who he wants in heaven with him. And so when you're born, uh, you're born, it's like, yeah, you're coming, um, you're not. Sorry. And, and so that's some of the, some of the preaching that, that we hear sometimes. We hear this idea of predestination. And, and here's what's true is God does know who he wants to be in heaven with him. Well, it's all of us. And so when we hear this idea of predestination, it's not, and this idea of elect, it's not, hey, there's this certain group of people that God's already decided is going to be there with him. It's he's adopted each and every one of us and says, I want every single person on the face of the planet to be in heaven with me. I want them to experience this plan of salvation that, that I have for them. I, I want them regardless of, of their potential. I want them before they, they fulfill their potential. He wants every single person person on, on the face of the planet. And, and just let me, let, let me just stick with me here. Just let me think, okay, I get it, I get it, I get it. He, he wants Republicans in heaven with him. He, he loves Democrats. He loves Nazarenes. He loves Baptists. He loves life church folks. He, he, he loves people who follow the law. He loves the lawless. He loves atheists. He loves the people who have committed atrocities. Okay, that's where it gets a little tougher for us. Right? You see, God developed this plan for every single person on the face of the planet 
to have a relationship with him before they fulfilled their potential. And he loves you. And when we look at this passage and we, we, we understand that this passage is going to kind of provide a little frame of reference for us that, that should remind us not only of God's love for us, but it is going to unveil for us the depths to which God is, has gone. And we're going we're gonna to dig that out a little bit. And so in Ephesians chapter 1, starting at verse 3, Paul tells us, All praise to God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Because we earned it. No, because we have been united with Christ. You see, God through his adoption, what Paul is saying here, of us, um, he adopted us. And, and through that adoption, what he's saying here is, is that he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Everything that God has, you and I, have access to. He doesn't say that, that the Father, our Lord Jesus, blessed us with some of the spiritual blessing. It doesn't say that, that God's trying to figure out whether you've earned it or not. What it says is, all praise to God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, because he has blessed us with absolutely everything that we need To change this world. I just want you to look around really, really quick. And, and as you look around, you see all the people that are here this morning. Everybody in here has the ability to change the world. Not because you're so unique. We've already covered that. But because God adopted you and he loved you and everything that God has, you now have access to if you are united with Christ. Folks, this is good stuff. I get goosebumps even though I've gone over this several times come before this morning and, and this idea that, that God loves us so much and, and that he predestines every single person on the face of the planet to have a relationship with him and that he gives us access to everything that he has and he doesn't hold back anything. And some of us are thinking, well, he's holding from me. He's holding back from me because, man, my life's a mess. He's holding back from me because, you know what, I prayed this prayer one time and it didn't, it didn't happen for me. And Scott, you know what, I, I prayed and, and I really felt like I, I gave myself to Jesus, but now my life is taking a turn that, that I never thought it would take. He's taking me in a direction that I'm not sure I want to go, so... And the problem that we have is, is sometimes we don't see God's blessing because we're still focused on what we believe our blessing should be, what we deserve, what the rest of the world tells us that we should have. And in focusing on that, we miss it. The glorious awesomeness of what God has called us to. And then we move from there to, to verse 4. And verse 4 says, Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy without fault in his eyes. Again, he didn't call you to wonder every single day. He didn't call you to say, you know what, I'm just never going to be able to live up to it. I'm just never going to be able to, to, to uh, get past the sin in my life. I'm, I'm just, I'm going to sin, and I'm going to sin in word, thought, and deed. I'm going to do that every single day. There's just, that's it. That's all I'm going to do. It's not what it says. What it says is, even before he made the world, God loved us. And he chose in us. He chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. 
Well, who am I going to listen to? Am I going to listen to the world that tells me, hey, I'm going to sin in word, thought, and deed every day? Or am I going to listen to God? See, God's chosen you to be holy. He's chosen you to live without fault. And if he's chosen you, we talked about this last week, he's going to encourage you, he's going to give you what you need to make that happen. Amen? Amen. And all we really have to do is we have to, to, to embrace this promise, we have to embrace this good thing that God has given us, and we need to live every single day as if this is true. We don't always do that. Verse 5. God decided in advance to adopt us. Again, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. I love this last line. This is what he wanted to do. And he and it gave him great pleasure. And so as we've looked at this passage, we see that the plan of salvation originated from God. God originated the plan of salvation. And not only did he originate, he didn't originate this plan after we screwed it all up. Okay, so Adam and Eve happened and they screwed it all up and, and, and God says, well, let's go back to the drawing board. You see, God loved us enough that before uh, he even created us, before he even thought about you, he said, what if they don't live up to their potential? What if uh, the people that I have created go their own way? And so before you were even thought of, God originated the plan of salvation. Don't believe me? I just read it. Okay, um, I'm not making that up. I can't make that up. I can't change that many Bibles. From, from before uh, we, we were even thought of, before the creation of the world, God originated the plan. And then we see that Jesus is the one that makes the plan possible. You see, God doesn't just start the plan. God follows through with the plan. Through Jesus Christ. Now the whole crazy thing about this is that any time God could have changed his mind. I think sometimes we think God's locked in. I think sometimes we think, well, you know what? God has to do this. God doesn't have to do this at this particular point. He doesn't have to think about your tomorrow. He doesn't have to think about you before you come to being. He doesn't have to do any of those things. He he could change things on the fly. But aren't you glad that's not the God we serve? And, and, and as, we, as we understand this, uh, the, the, probably the biggest thing that, that we don't see is, is that this plan brings pleasure to God. And see, and the result of that is, is that it brings pleasure to us. Do you ever give that much thought to your life? To the people in your life? Do you, ever, do you ever sit down someday and, and think, you know what, there's these people that I'm going to bring into my life, and let's just say you adopt somebody, and, and, and I'm going to bring it into my life, and, and you think ahead of time of how to make them prosperous or effective? Very few of us do that. Usually the questions we're asking is, are they worthy of being in my life? Are they going to hurt me? Are they going to fulfill their potential? Are they going to add something to me? Do you see how 
opposite that is, the way God thinks? Because if you really want to take this to its logical conclusion, God knew that some of us were going to break his heart. Otherwise, why give the plan? And then it pleased him to do so. (laughs) It pleased him to provide a way for you and for me to continue an unbroken relationship with him. Not just when we die and go on to eternity, but in this moment right now. See, I'm convinced there are some people that need to hear that this morning. You see, I'm convinced that there are people that have lived their life just wondering how they were going to measure up to God's standard. There are people that are wondering, you know, that if am I ever going to be seen as, as God's child? Am I ever going to be forgiven? Am I ever going to measure up? And, and what God's saying through this act right here is that I already thought about all that. And I want you, even if you don't believe that I want you, And see, I'm I'm convinced that then the result of this plan, when we look at Romans chapter 8, uh, Romans chapter 8 starting at verse 28, um, the result is, is, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good, for those who love God and are called according to his purposes for them. He doesn't say that everything is good. This idea that if you give yourself to Jesus that everything's going to be fantastic and that you're never going to have a problem and things are going to go by okay and and that because um, God loves you that he's going to give you a million dollars, he's going to give you all kinds of health, he's going to give you all kinds of everything that you want and that that's how you measure whether God's happy with you or not, I wish you would throw that out the window because it's just not true. What he's saying is is that despite all the stuff in your life that's going wrong, for those people, uh, for those people who 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 love God, who are called according to His purpose, I'm going to make everything work for the good. Which begs the question: Who is called according to the purposes of God? Anybody want to take a shout? We all are. Verse 29. For God knew his people in advance. And he chose them to become like his son. So that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chose them, who is them? Us. He chose them, who is them? To come to him, and having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. Wow. Okay, you're not as impressed as I am. You see, when we replace them with us and we make this a little bit more personal and you apply this to every aspect of your life, part of the reason that this doesn't get really exciting to us is is, is sometimes I think we just know who we are and that we don't deserve it. And so it's hard for us then to accept this wonderful gift that God wants to give us. The gift of salvation that originated with God before creation. With you and me in mind. I mean, how could our, our life be, be different if we really allowed God to adopt us? 
And what I mean by that, in, in, in Jesus, in God adopting us, he has given us all of his resources, all of his gifts, and all of his abilities to become a powerful, positive force in our world. I'm so tired of Christians hiding under a rock waiting for the end of the world to come. I'm so tired of the woe is me, they're taking away this, and woe is me, they're doing this. Folks, you and I are adopted into the family of God. Folks, there's nothing that man can do to take away what God is already destined for you to do. Why in the world do we, do we worry so much about, about what other people can do, what other people say to us when, when God has adopted us into his family so that we can go be a powerful force in the world? He doesn't give us salvation so that we can say, oh, I'm God's. Because guess what? It doesn't matter whether or not you've accepted Jesus or not. You belong to God. Some of you are like, wait a minute. Unpack that a little bit. Because I'm not saying what you think I'm saying. You see, if I'm adopted as a child by a set of parents, guess what I still have a choice of? I have a choice of whether I'm going to be a part of that family or not. I may have their last name. I may have to live under their roof. I may have to eat their cooking. I may have to do all that stuff. But at the end of the day, if somebody adopts me, I get to choose. Am I going to be a part of that family or am I not going to be a part of that family? And I've known people that have adopted kids and those kids have decided not to be a part of that family. And so what they do is they reap the negative consequences of that. But even once they do that, the parents still love the child because they chose them. You don't erase that because somebody makes bad choices. You don't cease to belong to someone because you make bad choices. But you still have to reap the consequences of bad choices. And so God's created and has predestined every single person to have relationship with him. We all belong to him. It's just some of us won't choose to be a part of him. And if I don't choose to be part of the family, and I experience those negative consequences, then I'm not able to express love to other people. You see, the truth is this, is that when we don't allow God to express his love to us, we cannot express our love to other people. If you have a hard time loving other people, it's probably because you haven't allowed God to express his love to you. And even as I say that, some of you are saying, well, I'm a Christian. I gave my heart to Jesus. Man, thank you for that. And God thanks you for that. But when are you going to let him love you? When are you going to let him open up your mind, open up your hearts to things that have been closed off because the rest of the world told you that you weren't worthy? Or because maybe you didn't quite understand how this was all supposed to work out. There's a big difference between accepting Jesus as Savior and allowing him to to love you. And see, we can't then love the rest of the world until we allow God to love us. And I'm convinced that's part of the problem in the United States, in the American church, is is we are so so focused on, on, on saving uh, our, our faith and, and protecting this and protecting that and, and earning really is what we're trying to do is we're trying to earn some sort of special place in heaven. And all of this effort 
is for nothing. Because God already loves you. I'm not saying we shouldn't work for things, and I'm not saying we shouldn't try to be the best saint that we should be, but, but our motivation can't be so that God loves me more. He could never love you any more than before creation when he created a plan so that you and I could continue to have a relationship with him just in case we couldn't measure up. That's the God we serve. That's the God that loves us. In 1 Peter 2, 9, right before this, it talked about people who, who, had, who had rejected Jesus Christ and what would happen to them. But in, in verse 9, uh, it says, but you are not like that, meaning you have not rejected Jesus. For you are a chosen people, a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. Yes, this means God owns you. To do with you whatever he wants. But he's already proven he wants to do good. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Why did he save you? Not to say I'm his, but to love other people. You see, he did all of this because he knew that even though you were going to get it, and you were going to get it pretty quick because you're the witty ones, you're the smart ones. He knew there'd be some dumb ones around us. Because I've been that dumb one. Who... Well, they're going to make mistakes. They're, they're going to make choices. That are, they're going to pull them from God. And, and, and as they make choices that pull them away from God, as they do some dumb things, as they, as they screw up their life a little bit, he knew that he was going to need people in the Broken Arrow Church of the Nazarene that have already accepted the love of Jesus in their life. That, that he was going to make them, that you're going to be priest to somebody. You're going to hear somebody's confession. You're going to serve some people in your life. Well, not your job. Nope. Don't wear the white collar. You're going to be priest to someone. You're going to be the holy nation, the kingdom of God on earth. Who? The people that he predestined. Who did he predestine? Us. And, and, and then after, after that, um, um, he, we're God's very own possession. And as a result, we're going to show others the goodness of God. For he called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. We're going to accept our predestined destiny. Preordained destiny. So that we can help others accept their preordained destiny because everyone everyone is predestined to a relationship with Jesus but we have to choose it wouldn't it have been great if God didn't give us a choice Yes and no. It should make life a lot easier. <laughs> but we'd be serving God out of fear and obligation instead of serving him out of gratitude for the love that he's shown to us. What does it mean to accept this preordained destiny. Who does God say you are? This short clip tells you a little bit about that.
that when we, when we flash up something, that he has to be right because he is God. That kind of flies in the face of everything that we're told. But if I were a betting man, which because I'm a good Nazarene, I'm not. I put all my money on God. Because people have let me down. Truth be told, I've let myself down a time or two. But see, God, he hasn't. There's never been one thing that God has said to me that hasn't been true. Whether it's through his word, whether it's through an impression uh, of, of being with him, and at the end of the day, I owe my life to God, not to the man. At the end of the day, I owe my life to the one who, who before the foundation of the world made a way for me to have a relationship with him for eternity. Just on the chance that we screwed it up. I just wonder... Uh, uh, what if you could imagine a group of people that are, that are living out their preordained destiny in such a way that everyone around them knew that they too were preordained for greatness in the eyes of God. The last time I looked, that's the church. But in order for us to do that, some of us are going to have to let go of some things. And those things are pretty destructive in our life. We're going to have to let go of some lies that the world tells us. There are people within the sound of my voice this morning that I'm, that I'm certain you're struggling with this message. Not because it's not uplifting, not because it's not something you want to believe but because somebody's told you or you've bought into a lie that you don't deserve any of this you were adopted before you were born you were adopted before you reached your potential And you have all of this great stuff waiting for you. You have the ability to, to live life without shame. You have the ability to live life without fear. You have the ability to live life in confidence. That though the whole world may be going to hell, you're secure in the arms of Jesus. But you gotta choose him. And then you gotta let him change you. You gotta let him make you holy. He called you to be holy without blemish that's a lifelong that's a lifelong endeavor but he can begin that the moment you say Lord here I am and I love you with all of my heart I give you everything that I am I'm not going to fight you anymore I'm not going to hold on to garbage from, from my past I'm not going to hold on to, to negativity that that the people breathe into my life. I'm, I'm not going to listen to the newsman. I'm not going to listen to the to the to the atheist that's that, that's trying to, to to discredit everything that I believe. I'm not going to I'm not going to listen to the people who, who who just for whatever reason they they are hostile toward the faith. Father, I'm going to love you, and in loving you and accepting that love that you give me, I'm going to love all of those people that you predestined. And even though they may hate me, even though they may throw stones at me, I'm going to love them. You want to see America change? Forget politics. 
Forget what your teacher said in some respects. And accept the love of Jesus so that you can in turn love the rest of the world. What are you holding on to?